watch Gangs of London. Trust me. That's high. Trust praise, me. You know, bro. it's the it's incredible. Some of the fight scenes. So I, again, I know people want, want to want to get behind the scenes, mm -hmm. right? So can you just tell us what the experience was like, like making that with the like with the cast? How like time consuming? How mentally, physically draining was it? Because sex scenes, mm -hmm. as a man, and you're no matter even if it's acting, mm -hmm. something goes stand. You know <laughs> so like, how how does that work? I mean, that Do you sense. actually want me to demystify? Yes, please. Film? Yes, Are please. you sure? Yes, because yes, some, then you'll be watching. The problem I have some now is that when I'm watching a film, yeah. I would be like, oh, I'll be thinking about the production of it as opposed to just sitting in the store and enjoying it. I think you can know too much. Welcome to the Mekawani Show, brought to you by Our House Studios. Here, I'll bring interesting discussions with leading individuals in various fields, discussing their successes, setbacks, and everything in between. I also hope I can bring one or two laughs along the way. Welcome to the Mekawani Show. Today, I'm introducing a very special guest, a talented and accomplished actor that starred in hit TV shows, Gangs of London, and Slow Horses. <laughs> my brother and friend, Chuck Bear, Dear Sue, my Bro, brother. No, it's my pleasure to be here. Great to see you, my brother. Great, great to see you. Um, how are you doing? Yeah, man, I'm good. <laughs> are you I'm enjoying, good. enjoying Nigeria? I love Nigeria. I mean, and I'm not just saying that as like a platitude. Um, my relationship with the country has changed a lot mm. in the last, well, in the last 18 months, but also since I was a child. I'd be coming back and forth for like grandma's birthday or someone's wedding, uh, cousin's wedding, so, someone else is doing something. That's what I'll come for. Yeah. So always be just sat in the back of the car, following my mom and dad yeah. around, greeting, Don't greeting, greeting. greeting. <laughs> Don't worry, we're going to we're going to touch a lot on your back on your background. Okay, okay, okay. Um, but yeah, again, just welcome, and um, it's great to have you on the show, bro. So uh, first, of all, I want to start. Uh, on this show, we talk about sport, we talk mm -hmm. about life, relationships, success. But I want to start on something I know that's very, very dear, dear to you. Okay, right, is football. Okay, yeah, definitely. So. How did your love for football start? Because I, I watched an interview and you said that if you weren't an actor, yeah. that that would be probably the thing that you would love to do the most. I mean, that's such a whimsical thing to say because there are so many people who are on that journey to becoming footballers who don't make it. Yeah, I know that. Is it Trent that set up recently like a, a, a program for boys yes, who are in yes, the academy? Yes. It, so one cannot just say that, oh, if I wasn't this, I'd be a footballer. Yes, like, yes. There are people doing it and trying today who are fitter than me, more yeah. agile than me, better football players than me. Yeah. But like, if it was a utopia that anyone could do whatever they wanted to do, that would be it. I think football is the thing that just brings me the most joy. It's like a moving meditation for me. I know some people go and do yoga to like relax or meditate. Like playing football is where I get to switch You're off and place. like be inside my body. How did I come to love football? I'm not really sure. Um, was I it just, Arsenal? Did it start with Arsenal? Like, did you, did you actually start with loving to play or mm -hmm. watch? Or is it both like... Well, um, what I was going to say together. was that my dad watches football sometimes more as if it's a coercion. But if he watches it, he's, in, he's involved. Yeah. And he says that he doesn't like to watch because it gives him heart palpitations. <laughs> so that's why we never support a team, yeah. never commit to anything because just watch match of the day with me maybe. And then he, you, I can see him get <laughs> over a Fulham game. Yeah. like, bro, you don't even know anybody that's playing. But is that that back man, that back man? <laughs> So um, Arsenal, Arsenal. Let's yeah. let's let's, yeah, let's how, focus on how, that. How, how how did I, and first of all, everybody knows I, I don't hate Arsenal, but I'm a Man United fan, and Arsenal for me are the biggest rivals. I know Liverpool are our biggest rivals, mm -hmm. like technically, but I think for Nigerian for Nigerians and like for in our generation, yeah. I think for Nigerian Arsenal fans, Man United fans, mm -hmm. I think we're our, like yeah. our biggest rivals. So um, how how did your love for Arsenal? Start? Well, I'll start by saying that it's it's out of love that I didn't wear an Arsenal shirt <laughs> on the show today. I was deciding what to wear. I was just like, no, uh, let, let him wear him stop rest, you, let him rest. Stop you. <laughs> um, why Arsenal? Yeah, why um, Arsenal? I know this story very very well. It, when I was, I must have been five or six. We were playing in the playground. I went to a school in North London in Mill Hill, yep. Dulles Juniors, shout out. <laughs> um, and my friend was actually being bullied by Man United fans. Yeah, we used to do that back in the day. Yeah, see? <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he was an out-and-out -out Arsenal fan. Okay. And they would corner him in the playground, be like, ah, oh, you're an Arsenal fan, your team's rubbish. Just at six, you know, children mm -hmm. are wicked. But I hadn't committed to a team before then. And actually... 
strictly speaking, I should have been a Man United fan because my mom said that she was. I was surprised. This woman loves Jesus. And she, the, Red uh, the Red Devils will be her club. I'm like, I would always challenge her on that. Like, what, what are you talking about? She's like, no, 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 no. That was fine. I'm a Man United fan. I was like, okay, sure. But because my friend as an Arsenal fan was being bullied by Man United fans, I then said, I'm an Arsenal fan as well. You're going to bully me. And I was a big kid. So they're like, no. And, that, and that's how it started. <laughs> and because I, it came out of my mouth, I had said it. I was like, okay, I better start backing this thing yeah. with action. But I actually, from six to maybe 20, I never went to a stadium. I'd never seen a football match live. On TV, I, I was a I was a fan in in sort of a casual, it? more casual fan. Yeah, yeah casual. I mean, like, I cared. Yeah, I, I would watch much of the day. I want the team to win the league. I would celebrate when we won games. I cared, but I never had the opportunity to go and sort of be in the atmosphere of the, of the stadium. Um, and I'm very grateful to a friend of mine who took me for the first time. I think it was in 2013, maybe 2012. That I saw my first game. Yeah. Who would you say is your favorite Arsenal player of all time? I mean, he's on has the to wall, be. isn't it? Has yeah. to be. Yeah. Although, I mean, like, if you take him out of the conversation, then I think we have a yeah. more interesting conversation. Um, oh, tough. It is tough. They're, over the years, we've had, we've been blessed with lots of players. Players like Santi Cazola, for mm. example. Just his technical ability. Quality, like, yeah. standing in the corner, because he only says other foot, other foot. He's yeah. like, okay, cool. Quality, like, quality. Yeah. Policy. When him and Coquelin were playing in the center against City, the first time we won at Etihad, I was like, this guy is a magician. Um, I only wish that a lot of our players were able to stay fitter for longer. Players like DRB, Wilshere. Yeah, he had a talented group yeah. at that time. It's just Eduardo, a bit of yeah, like, injuries and experience. And I think... Things could have been very different if yeah, we hadn't had those major ones. Ramsey. Yeah. Mm. So would you say... So apart from obviously, obviously Arsenal is your first love, would you say... Like this season going forward, like what are your hopes, expectations? I know whenever this comes out, depending, we don't know how Arsenal will be doing at that sure, point. Yeah. <laughs> but what are your hopes at this point in time, recording before the Bayern, the Bayern match mm -hmm. in the Champions League, doing well in the Premier League? What are you hopeful about? Specifically with in terms of Bayern? Um, no, so us, the Premier no, League and Champions League. Okay, sure. Yeah. But I'll say yeah. about the Bayern yeah. match, I want us to win one of those legs. Okay. We may not qualify. Yeah. We may not we probably will not win the Champions League. But in terms of the history of pain that Bayern has inflicted on us in the club, <laughs> first note, I'll tell you, ninety percent of the fan base wanted either Bayern or Barcelona in this uh, semi-final, uh, quarter-final, yeah. sorry, because we know we have a team now that we can put out and be proud of, a team that will compete, a team that will do us well yeah. and be like, you know what, we tried. Because to have your last two games be ten two on yeah, aggregate, you can exercise some five demons one, with five them, yeah. one, no, yeah, no, no, we need to fix that. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't want to come across as if I'm apologizing or like lowering my expectations. Everybody wants to win, wants to win the league, definitely. We, we wish we won the league last year. But I'm just so glad to be in a space now where we're competitive, where we can beat Liverpool, we can beat City. Yeah. We, those games are no longer like, oh, let's just forget about them, yeah. see what else we can do in the league. Like, we can beat Man United. We're... It, be it a top four, top six, top seven, I don't mind. But as long as we're in the conversation, the conversation. come May or come April, that's that's what I want. Okay. Okay, that's enough Arsenal talk on uh, my <laughs> no, show. No, we can continue today, if you want. <laughs> that's enough. I've, I've never heard Arsenal mention so many times. Okay, so <laughs> now we're done with that. Thanks for that, bro. Um, so I want to touch on your upbringing. I'm mm -hmm. very, very particular about finding out like why people are who they are. Okay. And I feel like a lot of that, that stems from how they were brought up, their environment mm -hmm. and, and things like that. So I want to talk about you being born in London, Edgeware, London, mm -hmm. and having obviously Nigerian parents and yeah. being a Nigerian yourself. What was that like, you know, growing up in, let's say being in school and having like a certain environment and mm -hmm. culture, then going home to like parents that speak Yoruba, that, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, you know, maybe discipline is a bit more like, you know, strict. Mm -hmm. So like, what was that like? How was that for you growing up? It's funny because I'm only conscious of this one life that I've lived. And therefore, I don't really have much else to relate it to, except like, I suppose, my friends, my peers. And in hindsight, I'm very grateful for the life that my parents gave me. I know that they came from Nigeria to England. They said, oh, we'll have our children here and then we'll go back. As in like, maybe when we were five, my sister's three years younger than me, so maybe five and two, okay, we'll carry them back. But they didn't. They stayed. They stayed because they knew that the life that they would be able to give us in England would be, they thought it would be better than that in Nigeria. Um, and I know that my life would be very different if I was raised here. Just different. Not better, not worse, just different. And maybe I wouldn't be sat here. We'd still be friends, that much I know. Yeah. But 
maybe I'd be sat here as an actor, maybe we'll be sat here as something yeah, else. Totally different experience. Yeah, so I get you. I, I'm grateful. But I, I am very aware of the differences that we had. Like, oh no, you have to be home by a certain time or you can't go and sleep in somebody else's house. And the relationships that I was able to form as a consequence of some of the restrictions that were put on me growing yeah. up. But I, I, I look back and I say, maybe I wouldn't change anything. Yeah. You know? Would you say like in school, like did you feel ever feel like different? Like from a young oh, age? Bro, like I said before, <laughs> children are wicked. Yeah. Like, some of the white boys especially were very active in making sure that I felt othered. Um, and at the time you think, oh, you know, got a thick skin, just going to roll with the punches or give some back. But in hindsight, when I look at it, people are wicked, yeah, man. Same. Some of the, are, are, are some of them I'm still carrying to this day, like some of the, 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 the barbs, the taunts, the questions, the mockeries. And it's like, wow, just because someone is of a different, really different. Uh, nationality Race, or from a different everything. heritage than yeah. you, it's crazy. So how do you balance that? Like, okay, again, would you say you're British, Nigerian? You know, how do you balance that? You know, not otherness, but like the uniqueness of it, right? And like, how do you feel like that has shaped you? So in sense of, again, like the different cultures, but also like your identity. Mm -hmm. So like, how do you see yourself? How do you perceive yourself? You know, it's, it's it can be tricky, you know, for people mm -hmm. for like, you know, like mixed, um, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, It's interesting. My, my partner is uh, biracial. Okay. Um, and whilst I would never claim to understand the nuances and intricacies of that experience. I feel like I have like a, a peep through the curtain yeah. of it because of going to school in what can be like conservative white environment and coming home, like you said, you're about parents, you're about church yes. and having to move between these two very different extremes. However, I'm very lucky and grateful that I'm not the only person that's had this experience. Yes. The diasporic community of Nigerians in, in England is yeah, huge. Yeah, yeah. I so think lot. actually if you were to separate all of the black people and count how many Nigerians, we pass everybody yeah. else. Um, so in, even including my cousins, friends, like I have a good support network yeah. of people who have endured and enjoyed the yeah. same experiences. So... Uh, in terms of who is how it's made me who I am, like I'm grateful for the access to different spaces, but also grateful for the community yeah. that are doing the same. Because I've always sensed your your passion for Nigeria, because you know, again with the diasporan community, there's some, and not none is right or wrong, but there's mm. some that maybe are a bit more removed and don't necessarily care, or you know, they, they weren't brought up here, so I mean, they have no necessary like necessary reason to like really be passionate about Nigeria. Mm -hmm. But like all the times I've met you, um, I've always sensed that okay, yeah, you were brought up there, you were born there. But like, there's still that passion for Nigeria, like how you dress, even like interviews I, I watched like um, in the UK, mm -hmm. that you're always like plugging like Nigerian artists, you know, talking about like the dances, the songs and mm -hmm. everything. So mm -hmm. I can sense like that passion for Nigeria. And was that something that you really got from the household? Like your parents very, like they, were, they made sure you always remembered your roots or was it just innate? I don't think it would have been possible for me to forget where I'm coming from. Um, especially because my grandparents, my mom's mom traveled back and forth a lot. Um, so she would be there for our graduation, be there for some of our birthdays, etc. But um, my dad's mom, who did come back and forth, every time a new grandchild was born, she would be there to do do the the rituals and the ceremonies. But my granddad on my dad's side, especially, like he was only ever here, so we had to come back, and that meant I had an anchor in the country. Yeah. I had experiences that I called from. I had um, things that I wanted to celebrate, things that I was desperate to improve in the country. Um, again, the community that I spoke about before, the diaspora community, we we both, uh, what do you call it? We make fun of, but we celebrate yeah. our heritage, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, but to answer your question. No, I think, I think honestly, you have been, um, you really touched on it there because again, like you said, as diaspora community, you guys celebrate and of course, you make fun of it as well. Like we all do. Like mm -hmm. that's part of being Nigerian, Absolutely, you know. Yeah. Like you, you can't you celebrate, but we also like you know Nigeria. Like we know, right? So I think it's um that that's unique experience. I'm always very interested to find out how again how people grow up, how mm -hmm. they thought their their thought process on things, their experiences, because I think all those things make you the man that you are today. Mm -hmm. With like you know successful, accomplished, but again like always remembers his roots and it's clear like your upbringing and like your closeness to the country, having to come back with your grandparents and everything, that made a huge difference. Mm. So talking about parents, like we know you're an actor, successful actor. And before we even touch on your specific projects and mm -hmm. things like that, how did the passion for like acting come about? And how did your Nigerian parents, you know, like, okay, my son wants to be an actor. You know how it is now. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, are you, you know, like, you know, normal, like lawyer, doctor, doctor engineer, yeah, things yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. So, so what was that? What was that like? How did the passion come about? I remember 
there were, there are two reasons, I think. Firstly, is when I moved to my secondary school, um, there, I think there were maybe two, three, four maybe of us that yeah. came from my primary school into that secondary school. So we had a little group of people to rely on, but it was a much larger environment. Yeah. I think like thousands of children as opposed to just the and big older adults, you know? So it was an opportunity for me to ingratiate myself into the school system, the school environment, like get to know different people from different classes, different year groups, this and the other. Like how do I become a part of the ecosystem that is the mm. school? One. Two, in the playground of that school, maybe year seven, year eight, so that's 12, 13, yeah. 14. I was like, everyone's like, oh, I want to be this, I want to be that. I was like, that, that sounds cool. That's good as well. Why can't I do all of these things? Why do I have to choose? Why do I have to like pigeonhole myself into this one thing? So I thought at the time that acting would just be an opportunity for me to do all of these different things, you know? I'll just pretend to be a doctor yeah, for a bit. Yeah, pretend. That's crazy, yeah. In fact, I remember I had a friend at university who was a, a medic studying medicine. Mm -hmm. And I was the one that was seen to be a doctor before they had even graduated <laughs> because I was in one of in one TV series I played a junior yeah. doctor. Um so that's what I thought acting was then. You know, that's crazy. I've never actually heard it from that perspective mm. before, where like, you know, you, you want to be an actor because you, you can actually play those roles and play mm. them very convincingly, yeah. right? So I think that's, that's actually very, very unique, a very, very unique take on that. So you started um, like on stage at the, you successfully auditioned for like the Royal Shakespeare Company mm. in like 2012. Mm -hmm. So what, before we, like, I want to know like the differences. So what, what's, what's it like being on stage, like acting on stage? And how does that compare to like being on movies and series, like in terms of like the lines, in terms of the process, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like what's the differences and, you know. Two main things for me. Okay. Rehearsal and it's live. <laughs> True. <Live. laughs> um, rehearsal, the opportunity to spend weeks in a room with the other people that you're going to be sharing the story with, not just your scenes, but everybody who will be coming together to make this story and interrogate and challenge and fight for what version of the story we want to be telling. You don't get that on TV and film because you may never see some people who are not in scenes with you, unless it's at the rap party or at the early read-throughs at the beginning of blocks. So for someone who may never share a scene with, to have an opinion on your part of the story and you defend it, that's so important well, yeah. because it helps you to believe in what you're doing. And if and if you are challenged and you don't have the minerals yeah. to defend it, then maybe it's because you're wrong yeah. and you have to like re remove your ego yeah. and just allow that so that it can be the best version of the story awesome. possible. And then the live performance aspect of it, like you can't be like, oh, yo, I'm sorry, can how we go again? How nerve-wracking is it like, or I guess the more you do it, the more comfortable you get, but like how, what's it like acting on stage with your lines mm. and the body language? And you know, like again, like being part of a group and a cast. Yeah. Like, what, what's the, what's that feeling like? I love it, man. Yeah. I I I love it. Um. I re and also, I don't really get nervous, yeah. and I don't mean that as a brag. Yeah. Uh, I've I've always been very good with learning my lines. I I know that I'm prepared. Whenever I'm going into a stage show, even if we're going to rehearse things and change them later in the run, like we've earned this moment as far as I'm concerned. So I'm always good. That, yeah. But I'll never forget the time that I was most nervous. Um, it wasn't even a full play. It was just I was doing a speech from Othello for a gala performance uh, for the National Youth Theatre. We are raising money for the charity. And they had told me what speech they wanted me to do like two days before. So in terms of learning my lines, I didn't was, have the time. Yeah. And in the dress rehearsal for the show, I didn't have my lines, wow. bro. So that lack of preparedness, I think, is what generated mm -hmm. the nerves. But Another thing, like in some theatres, in some stages, you get onto the stage and you actually can't see the audience. Okay. You know that they're there, you can hear them, but you can't see them because the, the footlights are in your eyes. So that's what happened in that performance. I came up onto the stage. There were some people who were performing before me. They made space for me to move through them and then deliver the speech. And I was like, I don't know these lines. I'm, I'm about to flop. Yeah. And it's going to be a very expensive and embarrassing <laughs> flop. Like there are so many important yeah. people in this audience yeah. who are watching me. And then the, the words just came because I knew that I had done as much preparation as I could. And I didn't feel the pressure of them there because I couldn't see them. see them. That helps. So yeah, that helps. So now you've said the differences. So what would you say is easier or harder to perform in shows, like movies or on stage? Ah, uh, um, 
I don't know that one is harder than the other. I think obviously you have the safety net of, sorry, can we go again with um, TV and film? Because it's all camera, it's going to be edited later. So there's a pressure that comes with live performance that is more difficult. But really, I don't think that I can prepare one less than the other because it's about my own integrity and the work that I'm putting in to give a good performance will, will always be the same regardless yeah. of the medium that I'm working in. But you say your preference though is to like on stage, you prefer the process. Ooh, I, if I could combine the two, if I could have the rehearsal period and then do it on film, yeah. I think I enjoy not having to rely on the audience's imagination or letting them do any work. I would love to present it. I also travel you, man. <laughs> yeah. Like you get to yeah. work all over the world when you're... I mean, you can tour theater shows. You can go from country to country. But well, in different. terms of being location to location, yeah. like June, they'll shoot in Saudi Arabia. Then they'll go somewhere else. Yeah. Or one of them ones, like, that's also part of the thing that's that I enjoy about my work. Well, you know, yeah, there's like some people just love like, so the whole stage thing, I feel like, you know, it's like traditional, like pure acting, mm -hmm. as they say. Mm -hmm. But even like the guy um, from Succession, um, Brian Cox, mm -hmm. He's really old, really, really accomplished. Now he's like, I think he's retired from maybe like proper like movies. Okay. And he's gone back to like the stage. stage. Okay. So it's like, he just talked about how much he loves like mm -hmm. the, you know, like a British, like Shakespearean kind mm -hmm. of theme. Like he just loves like the, the process of that. I always find that really interesting that, I would know, love like the differences. To, I would love to be able to do one play every year. COVID was the one that interrupted yeah. that. And I actually haven't been on stage since 2020, before COVID. Yeah. Um, and then also... I remember a friend of mine was saying that his ambition was to do enough screen and film stuff that whenever he wanted to do a play, it would just happen. Just... And I think there's uh, there's still some wrongs in the ladder I have to climb before I can get to a point where, oh, Shockwave Dirusu, yeah. I can't even say my own name, that's crazy. <laughs> where Shockwave Dirusu is doing a play and everybody wants to be there, the thing will sell out immediately. Yeah. Like When you're that financially viable, the world is your oyster. Yeah. And I think he is now. Yes. Because of not just succession, but the body of like work his, he's yeah, done before. He's so hugely accomplished, yeah. Everybody wants to go and see his King Lear. Everyone yeah. wants to go and see whatever he's doing next. Yes. And I would love to be in a position where I can, um, you know, have things made because yeah. I'm a part of it. So I think one thing I, I've always wanted to know with like, so now we're going to like movies, series and acting, even, even with like the show I'm, with the stage players, like lines. Mm -hmm. Like you watch, I watch some things, right? And they go on like, Four, four, five minute like soliloquies. Do you do that like one time? And like, I mean, obviously not one time in the sense of like, of course you make mistakes, but like, do you like maybe stop like cut like the scene like two minutes in, and then maybe like quickly like look at the lines again, or like do you actually remember the line for five minutes? Yes, you mess it up a bit, but like you actually have to do a five minute take of mm -hmm. those lines. Or how does it work? If that do makes, if that do makes you sense. actually want me to demystify? Yes, please. Film? Yes, Are please. you sure? Yes, because yes, some, then you'll be watching. The problem I have some now is that when I'm watching a film, yeah. I will be like, oh, I'll be thinking about the production of it as opposed to just sitting in the story. And enjoying it. I think you can know too much. So are you sure you want me to answer this I, question? I, I think we, I think okay, we want cool. to know, yeah. Um, yes, you will do a five minute take. Okay. And you will do it 20 times. Okay. And then within those a hundred minutes of they will find the best parts and they'll put it together. I see. And then if they have bits of the story that needs to change or things, lines that you didn't get quite right, there's a studio session after the shooting period where they'll ask you to come and say those lines again. I see. You can have the lines in front of you. So maybe they'll the camera will come to the back of your head so they won't people won't see your I mouth know, moving oh, again yeah. and you'll just do ADR, additional dialogue recording. And it's so funny that a lot of actors who have worked a lot in screen will be like, that was ADR, that was ADR. I know because you get yeah, the experience. That's crazy, of, yeah. yeah, your lips weren't moving perfectly in <laughs> line with what you were saying. Yeah. So another thing, sex scenes. Mm -hmm. Uh again, I got how does that work in the sense where there's some and I know I've read some things that okay, maybe they're like um like they're maybe like layers or like I don't know it's called I don't know what this, maybe a pillow a or pillow or something. Yeah. As a man, and you're no matter even if it's acting mm -hmm. and Nigeria, I don't I don't want to be crude, but like something goes stand. <laughs> so like how how does that work? And again, obviously being like in a relationship or whatever, I think these are the things that people would want to know. Yeah. So like when you're in those kind of scenes, let's say if someone attractive or maybe not even attractive, mm, like how 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 like how does that work? And like, how do you handle that? Like how you feel like physically? So there's a professional answer and there's a real answer. Yeah, I'll give both. both. The first one, the professional answer is that the industry has changed a lot in the mm. last 10 years. Now we have what is called an intimacy coordinator. Okay, yes. And they're, they're basically the same as a stunt coordinator, but for intimate scenes. 
So you will now choreograph exactly what the scene's going to look like so both people can feel comfortable. And there will be a go-between. So if we were doing a scene together, for example, it's not that we'd be sat here, the three of us, and I'll, I want to do this, I want to do that. Like, no, they'll come and meet me. They'll come meet you separately. They'll go and meet the director. And then between them and the director, they would take all of the things that were set into account. And then we will be presented with what the best version is with everyone's yeah. um, opinions and how safe and comfortable yeah. they feel. And I think that's a very good process because before, especially in terms of patriarchy and men overpowering women and making them do things that they want to do, yeah. like it, it, we are now able to avoid that. And sometimes maybe if you've rehearsed something over and over again, you know it's mechanical. No longer are you sort of like just instinctively aroused. Like you're, you're like thinking about like yeah. what you're... Because like, you're thinking you're... about, no, my hand has to go there, yes, it has yes, to stop yes. there. And it becomes like... Less of a dance and yeah. more of like a, a mechanical something. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. And then your job is then to make that mechanical something look real and intimate for yeah. the camera. Um, so have you ever had any like accidents? Like in a sense so where like... I haven't yet actually done okay. an intimate scene like that. Okay. So on film, on film anyway. I've done it on stage. And I remember my dad... This is when I was very young as well. <laughs> like I think I was still in school. My dad was at the back of the auditorium watching it. And I was just like... Even though I had my dad's eyes and the pressure of that on the back of my head, like something goes down. Yeah. You know? So I was just like, how do I now maneuver this so that I can just like get yeah, that out of the yeah. way? Yeah, I mean, you like, have do to you, like, it. how, but would you, would you say that, okay, you haven't really done that to like that um, extreme, like mm -hmm. maybe scene or whatever, but like from your experience in the industry, are they quite hard to do? And is it like, obviously now there's an intimacy coordinator, mm -hmm. but like, is it quite, is it difficult to do or is it just like part of the job? I think it's yeah, one of those things where you haven't experienced something yet, so it's difficult to speak with authority. Yeah. I would like to think that it's quite easy to do because if you've done your character preparation well and you know your character's relationship with that other person, then you'll be able to find the anchors of attraction. You'll be able to uh, give meaning to the event. Yeah. Um, it's not just a mindless sex scene. It's not pornography. It's like these two characters are telling a story through what's happening yeah. in this scene. So I would like to think that it would be sh yeah. not straightforward, yeah. but like not difficult to do. Because I think um, I'm mostly talking as like a layman and like a like a someone that watches movies, right? But like if I was that was my job, and again, like I want to be excellent at my job, I've prepared for my job. Mm. Like those kinds of things, I guess in that moment, like you're not going to be thinking like someone that's watching like ooh, like you know this looks so you yeah. know what I mean? No, I mean you're like actually trying to get it to work. Mm -hmm. Other people are like watching you, relying on you to like get things right. You don't want to waste people's time. Yeah, yeah. And so, you like, want to watch it and be like, I believe that I, yeah, those that, that, people that, are that really, that really yeah. worked. You know, that, that was really like solid. So yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And that, that type of preparation, again, like talking about like the dark, maybe the, a bit of the dark side of acting where you have to prepare like for the character and you might play some heavy roles. Mm. Um, I've, we've spoken about this a bit and I've watched some of your interviews on, on this as well. How how does that how is that to play like a role that takes you into like a bit of a dark place? Mm. And I know you've mentioned that you what maybe watch some comedies after to like decompress. Mm -hmm. But like what's that like like putting yourself into those roles that that take you maybe where you know you don't like to be? I know a lot of people say that you shouldn't. You should never have to um, go that far or like you, at the end of the day, it's acting, it's pretending. Don't become a masochist about it. Um, but different people have different processes and I don't judge them unless their process is starting to affect somebody else's process, you know? When you start making it difficult for other people to do their jobs because this is how you want to yeah. do your job, it's not, it's not, it's not good. Yeah. In any industry, in any walk of life, like do your thing, cool, but don't let your yeah. thing affect my thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you have to look after yourself. You have to have good people around you. Otherwise, we already know of instances in which like we've lost great, talented people because of this <laughs> the heavy sacrifices that they made to yeah. make good art you know so I don't want to be one of those people so do you say you you do you feel like you handle that process quite well when you're in that kind of situation and that you you know you're able to commit to your, like, yourself to the role but at the same time you you kind of still understand like there's bound there's a boundary that is it that you can't pass yeah I mean I haven't yet done a role done, I've done some roles that have required a lot of me but I haven't anything, done anything yet where it's like oh I actually had to go to a place that I would never want to go in myself yeah. I don't like exploring or having empathy for that kind of character uh, I haven't had to compromise myself yeah. like that yet but I hope that should because some, some of those roles are good and those stories need to be told so I hope that I've set up a good what's the word like 
ecosystem again around me with my partner, with my friends, with how I treat myself, yeah. self-care, mental health, to allow me to navigate those when they come. So having a partner in the industry in that sense as well, let's say she has, maybe does, maybe certain roles like that. How does that work that you don't bring in like your characters like into the home? Yeah, I mean, like neither of us are quote unquote method actors. Yeah. Um, yet we may find a part that but we for want the audience, to... what's, what's method acting? Oh, so method acting is when you find out everything about your character and then you start to live as your character off screen, off set. Um, for example, Daniel Day Lewis, when he was shooting, he was like the method yeah. actor of okay. our generation. Well, he's not my generation, he's one of us. <laughs> but um, when he was doing Gangs of New York, he would sleep in his costume, he would sleep on the set that they had built for his character. Oh, wow. He became ill. Because the was, thing was exposed, the thing yeah. was cold, but he's like, no, this is this is my environment. I want to live, breathe, eat, sleep as my character. Yeah. It can be very dangerous mentally, um, but the man has three Oscars, so <laughs> it works for some people, it doesn't work for others. So for young, before we move on, so for like young shop bears, the young, you know, actors, actresses, what, what advice would you have for them? Like what the experiences do they need? What do you think they need to focus on? Or mm. Like, you know, like to, to be successful? Watch everything. Watch anything you can get your hands on. I have an opinion about it. I like this because that was inspiring to me because I didn't like that. What you don't like is almost more important in teaching and learning and growing than what you do like. Um, when you see something that's perfect, you're like, okay, great. You can't learn from yeah. that. When you, if you don't make mistakes, you'll never know how to like, overcome in moments of uh, turmoil or stress or whatever. Um, so like, watch everything. Have an opinion about it. I've made a film diary whereby because like, I really enjoyed like this performance because of this. Um, and then it's just, I know, depending on where you are, opportunities can be few and far between. Yeah. But it's about putting yourself in front of camera, putting yourself in front of people who are making things, making th your own things if you have the capability for any. A lot, a lot of people are doing skits yeah. and comedy yeah, things. Yeah. And, and one of my favorite ones in Nigeria at the moment is Lai. Lai yeah, Masabi, I mean, yeah. yeah. And... He's now in um, what's that TV series uh, on Netflix? Uh, yeah, I saw like, I saw the like the ad for it. I'm, yeah, I'm not yeah. sure of the name, but I saw like the. But so from making his own content, from now putting himself in, now he's I'm not sure of his career beforehand, yeah. but he's now in spaces and rooms with people who are making films, making TV shows, and it's from off his own back yeah, that he's yeah, done it. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So like continue creating because yeah. as soon as you are creating, you're an artist. No one can tell you that you're not. Yeah. So don't wait for anybody else's approval. You give yourself, give it to yourself. Love that. Okay, so as we continue to get to know Shock Bear, we always have a quick, fast um, question segment. Okay. Okay, let's go. Favorite way to spend time off the movie set? Playing football. Yeah. Yeah. Simple. Simple. As uh, a, people will be upset with me for saying that, <laughs> but that's the truth. <laughs> so as a, as a British boy, <laughs> Jollof or... Sunday roast. Kind of nonsense question. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Jollof clean. That said, there are Jollof Sunday roasts in London. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and for anyone that doesn't know, I think Sunday roast is like what? Potatoes, like beef. Potatoes, roast like beef, mash, lamb, or thing. chicken. Yeah. And then you can have like a vegetarian option as well. And then it's like vegetables roasted again, yeah. parsnips, carrots, um, uh, gravy. It's a lot of, it's a lot of, spinach, it's a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so as an Arsenal fan, as we touched on, who do you dislike more, Man United or Tottenham? Tottenham. Yeah? Yeah, actually. Tottenham. Really? Yeah. Just, Why? Do you, do you know what? Man United, at least there was a rivalry. Like, yeah. Both of us were good. We were fighting. Yeah. You beat us many times. We beat us. You beat you many times. Tottenham were irre irrelevant. And then they had... They became... <laughs> I could hear, the, I could hear the, like, the... <laughs> You're already round And up. then with Pochettino, they grew up, you know? Yeah. And then they started to think that they were somebody... <laughs> yeah, they, they frustrate me, man. They okay. frustrate me. What's your most controversial football opinion? Take a second. Oh. I maybe someone you don't rate, maybe wow. someone it's, a manager, a player. It's wild, but I'm just like I think Mbappe is a confidence player. Yeah. <laughs> and I think because he's treated like a god, like I think there's some sort of bubble that's going to burst there somewhere yeah, soon. Um but uh, yeah, that's a hot that, take. Yeah, that's a hot one. <laughs> okay, so I think this this is an interesting one. Would you rather be prime Denzel Washington mm -hmm. or prime Thierry Henry? <laughs> like you are that person at their prime, their claim, their ability, the skill. 
the the charisma, prime Denzel the or reason, prime Ori. Uh, this is hard, man. But the, there's, the, I'm a very logical person, and the only reason I can choose prime Denzel is because his prime is a longer window. It's a longer period yeah. of time. Like, I think he's only just started to get old. Yeah. And he's been doing it since his well, mid late twenties. Yeah. So Great the uh, the 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 shelf life for an actor is a lot longer than that of an athlete. Yeah. That said, TT's in his prime, just not playing football yeah. at the moment. So it's hard. But so prime yeah. Denzel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, before I even go to the next question, who would you say is your like favorite actor of all time? I don't have one. You don't have one. No, I don't have one. There are many of them that inspire me, including Denzel, Chiwetel, but then also people like Jake Gyllenhaal, Woody Harrelson, you know, Viola Davis. Um, oh. No, come back right till the Swinton. Yeah. You know, there are so many like excellent performers. Yeah, um uh is in June. Um not not to not, not, not to not, be not. Um he's married to Penelope Pen- 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 Cruz. I'm not sure what I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Ah! Anyway, he's dope as well. Javier about them. That's one person. Javier about them. Okay. Nigeria, Nigeria or England winning the World Cup? Nigeria. Favorite Nollywood actor or actress? Like Shola all time. Shibuwale. All time. Who? Okay, Shola, Shola. Yeah. Or, or Pete Ndoshi. Okay. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's that the guy, legend. That guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the lines. Yeah, man. Um, David O, Whiskid, or Burner? Refuse to answer. <laughs> Good answer. Yeah. Good answer. Smart man. <laughs> no, God, he doesn't want to spoil any feature. <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> spoil We're, all We're all friends. We're all friends. Okay, what's your favorite genre of movie to act in? To act in? I don't know if I refer to act in what I want to do. Is either sci-fi or science fantasy. Okay. You know, I haven't had the opportunity to play in that space yet, and that's that'd be fun. What's the most expensive thing you've ever bought? House. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. All right. So before we touch on the the show that you said changed your life in Gangs of London, mm. I wanted to touch on Black Mirror a bit. In, okay. In, cool. Yeah. So I know you were in the episode Nosedive mm-hmm. in about 2016. And I remember when I saw that episode, and I remember like taking like a screenshot, showing it to all my friends. I'm like, I know him, like I know him. You know what I'm saying? So I, I don't know how was that experience for you, like well, doing a, a hit show like Black Mirror. The, the thing that you're recounting that like I know him is so important to me. I don't really like to publicize my work. I don't like shout. You see my social media, anything that's on there that's is by force. Yeah. Someone has told me that I have to do it. <laughs> And it's because I want to have those moments where someone's just like watching something because they want to watch yeah. it. There's something else that took them there. Either it's a genre that they like or a director that they like, other actors, whatever. And then they see, see. me in it. And it's like, he's at yeah, that level. Yeah, That's what yeah, he's doing. Yeah. I, I was, that pride yeah. is what I want to sort of yeah. give to. Um, I want people to be happy that they know me and then be proud of me. Yeah. Of that. No, yeah, I remember um, I was so excited. So what was, what was that like? Ne- the, oh, Black Mirror is funny, man, because... It's another job that was so important. And my, I'm on screen for 30 seconds. Mm. And it wasn't supposed to be me. Oh, really? Somebody else had the role. And then something happened in their lives where they couldn't make it to where they were going to shoot it again. It scheduled conflict. I don't know if it was a family, something. Whatever it was, God, they, they, they had to not do it anymore. And then it was me. They were like, oh, I auditioned for a different role in the series. And they were okay. like, oh, you didn't get that one, but just come and do this one. Mm-hmm. On Wednesday, they told me I need to fly out on Saturday to shoot on Monday. And... It was a wonderful experience. Like, Joe Wright is an excellent director. Yeah. He also made me feel very comfortable. Uh, Bryce Dallas Howard, who I was doing the scene with, also looked after me, yeah. you know. I also got a free holiday in South Africa out of it. It was oh, that, great. That's what, is that where yeah, they shot it in Cape Town. Um, so, but I didn't realize it was... Because I think it was the first... Or maybe it was the second series of Black Mirror that was then on Netflix, because before it was on Channel 4. Yeah, yes. I didn't know that the world was watching it like that. Yeah. And then... <laughs> I remember coming here in 2016 and somebody stopping me at a party being like, you were in Black Mirror. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, one of the things that I've done so far, like, that's the one. That's the one. 30 seconds. And it was just at the end. Yeah, yeah. it was just at the I'm end. Like, All right, cool, cool. Yeah, I'll take so, it. Do you feel like that maybe started opening doors or were you already doing things around that time that started like, opening doors? It's interesting. You? Like, you feel that Everyone will look at you and be like, that's the role that made you. Whereas they that neglects everything that's come before. Yeah, and then also, one. things that you shoot will not be released in the order that you shoot them. Mm. So, for example, His House and Gangs of London. Now, that's not necessarily a good example. But um, that small thing that I had in Black Mirror was just a tiny thing and a lot of things I was doing at that time. So, there would have been other things that actually were the ones that put me in the eyes of casting directors or directors. But... 
in terms of, I mean, your audience is another important part of your career, the people that make your career. So if that's what put me in front of the audiences, then that's cool by me as well. Before going to Gangs of, Gangs of London, I want to also talk on auditioning. Mm -hmm. So like the whole process of like auditioning, how difficult is it? How, you know, time consuming, you know, stressful is it? Or is it like, is it fun to like put yourself out there and like try for this role? Or is it like you see like hundreds of people like trying right. to get the role? Like what's that, what's that process like? Well, I was telling Chibi yesterday that I've done 557 auditions in my life Jeez. so far. So you have to get used to it. <laughs> wow. You know, it's, it is hard. And I know that I have friends who have left the industry just because the auditioning part of it, the opening yourself to being vulnerable, to then be rejected, like it became too much for them. Wow. And I appreciate that. There's no judgment there. The thing is hard. But um, yeah, I've gotten to a point where I will audition for something, forget about it, audition for something, forget about it. And then maybe if it comes back, then great. If yeah. it doesn't come back, I've, yeah. it's already not bothering me again. But I've only been able to get to that. I realize I've only been able to get to that position because I A, stuck it out for as long as I did when it was hard. Yeah. B, I'm at a certain level of my career where I know something else will come eventually. And at the beginning, you don't know that. Like I remember there have been peri periods of my life where I've been out of work maybe three months at a time. And the three months at the beginning of my career was devastating in comparison to three yeah. months now. Now I'm just like, oh, I can take a break yeah. and go holiday. Yeah. I can see my family. I can just chill and prepare for the next one. Whereas before, it's like, this is the end of my career. I'll never work again. So um, yeah, Aud auditioning is hard though. It's hard. Is there a, like a show or a movie that like everyone would be surprised to know that you auditioned for and maybe unfortunately you didn't get it? Like, like a, something big. Are you allowed to say? No. No? <laughs> there was because some of them have signed NDAs. Okay, on. you got so you can't also yeah. it's that kind of thing. You some can't of them, really say. They're, they're, they've broken my heart. Okay, I don't yeah. want to talk about it. Damn. But also some of them, like, you know what I'm saying? Like hundreds of people auditioned yeah. for the role. For example, John Boyega's role in Star Wars. Yeah. Like they had open auditions for it. Everybody that was an actor under a certain age in London was seen for that role. Uh -huh. However, it was bad because JJ yeah, was, yeah, already yeah. knew that he wanted yeah. to work with John because he saw him in Attack the Block. So, um, yeah. Yeah. If, they can be scattergun approaches. They could be very, we want it to be you. Sorry, the director or the producers or somebody yeah. in a faraway place said they don't want it to be you, want it to be someone else. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there there have been a lot. Of yeah. So Gangs of London, that, that I think that's uh, one of the best things I've ever watched. And oh. I urge all of you, if you can, watch Gangs of London. Trust me. That's high Trust praise, me. Bro. No, it's, the, it's incredible. Some of the fight scenes. So I, again, I know people want, want to want to get behind the scenes, right? Mm -hmm. So can you just tell us what the experience was like, like making that with the, like with the cast, how like time consuming, how mentally, physically draining was it? Because mm -hmm. again, watching some of the scenes as the viewer is draining in the sense where like the fight scenes, especially, you feel like you've, you've actually, you're, you're actually the one involved in mm -hmm. it. So for you that you're doing that, you're running, like you, you see that running like miles, like miles it seems. So what's that been like for you? Um, that experience what was that like for you especially shooting the first one uh, because in the first season we did a lot of the fight sequences and action sequences at the front of the series because I think the first two three episodes are quite laden with them so that you can understand what the identity of the show is um, I remember being at home just like this and someone was like what's wrong I was like nothing's wrong everything's good like, I'm very happy Like you look it's like oh I'm really tired I don't know why so like, what did you do today? Oh, well, you know, I fell from this building. And I was like, that's why you're tired. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, I suppose that does make sense. But because I was having so much fun, I didn't feel like work to me. Yeah. And therefore, I didn't equate that with the thing like, that would then uh, be fatiguing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, working with Gareth Evans, especially the creator of the series, like, it's just fun. It was fun. So much fun that I didn't realize how, how broken I was becoming. <laughs> so the cast, like I, I've also seen you mention like how much of a, like how close knit you guys are and how much fun it is. Is that not generally the norm? And because it seems like you're almost saying it almost kind of surprisingly that like it was mm. such a great show, great cast. So like, how is like the dynamics in like cast members generally? Is it like... Well, you know what I was saying before about rehearsal. Sometimes you won't see it. See, true, people. true, true, true. The, you may have an arc I'm, I'm very lucky in Gangs of London, especially because my character is the medium through which the audience perceives the world. So I get to meet a lot of the different people on the way and so forth. I get to spend time with lots of different actors. Yeah. Whereas there's some actors that are only in one storyline or only in one part of the... Th so yeah. they are completely ostracized. Yeah. Um, so they will have no sort of relationship with somebody else unless there's an active 
uh, effort made, made to, to bring people together. Yeah. And I think that's what was very special about that show, especially the second season. Um, Walid, who came in to play Koba, yeah. had parties at his house. He's okay. like, yo, everybody come, we're going to cook, we're yeah. going to have Sunday dinners yeah. together. And you don't get that on a lot of shows, yeah. especially when people are at home working. If people go abroad to work, yeah. then they, you foster a community because you've all yeah. left loved ones and routines and homes behind. You create a new home in this space. Yeah. But when you're working at home, like, now I've got to hang out with my There's friends. Stuff, yeah. I have no reason to continue with yeah. you. But people made it, went out of their way to do so. So how does it work? So like, let's say with the episodes, right? Like, so do you guys like shoot scenes, let's say in London or whatever for a day, then you go home, sleep, then you come back the next day, shoot mm -hmm. scenes. And then, so it's like a long form thing and then they cut the episodes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so if you have a series of eight episodes, yeah. they'll divide it into four blocks of two episodes. Okay. And then you may have four directors each doing a block yeah. or you may have three directors, one doing the first and the last and two directors doing the middle ones. Yeah. And so that gives you a chance like, okay, we're going to focus on these two scripts for this seven, eight week period. Um, all of the locations, because locations are repeated. You have okay. the Wallace house, so-and-so house, yeah. this factory. All of the scenes that happen in this location will shoot back to back okay. within this block. I see, I see. Uh, and then we'll go to the next location. Then we'll come back to that location if we go, if we see it again in another block. Yeah. And then they'll, but you still may be doing episode one, scene four, and episode two and scene 67. Because they're in the same location, yeah. you do it back next to each other. So you have to prepare the so mindset the, lines, the characters. So yeah. the lines, especially now, like, so it's like kind of not abstract, but like it's different scenes, different. So like how, so what's that process like with the, so as Elliot now, mm -hmm. so you just, you have the lines, let's say the, like the night before, obviously you've prepared already, but like, let's say you have the shoots the next morning. Mm -hmm. Are you like going over your lines again? Are you? Yeah, like, I mean, you, especially because it's on screen. It's not live, so it's, you don't okay. have it. You, you can be, you have your lines in your hand. Mm. You can constantly refer to them. Sometimes I will want to change lines because I think the character sounds better if he says it like this. Yeah. And then I'll take it to the director and the writer the next day and be like, how do you feel about me doing this? Can That's I do true. a take like that? How, how much creative, like, like... Um, it varies depending yeah. on your club. Okay. Um, and for me, it will, my, my level of desire to have input will vary depending on the quality of the work. Okay. If the work and the writing is so good, like the next project that I'm going on to, I'm so excited about it because not only just what happens in the episodes, but the way the characters speak to each other, the choices that they make, I can see that so much consideration has been has gone into this thing. I'm just like, that's perfect. Yeah. I want to do this. Yes. I don't want to make it easier to say. I don't want... You understand the vernacular of each of your characters, so I want to commit to that. Mm. Um, as opposed to like, you've not really thought this through. So let me see if I can tidy it up and I make it, it yeah, make sense, you. you know? So taking us into the mind of Elliot, I don't want not to give too much away, but like how much do you put into that character? You know, how much do you, do you still carry with you like today? Well, I mean, we just finished shooting season three. Yeah. So he's not too far away from me. Okay. But again, speaking about like being method or like the roles that bring you down because the character is low, like I don't, Partly because I finished season three, I was moving straight onto the project that I'm doing now, and then from there I'm going to go straight into something else. I almost don't have time to have the baggage to like, oh, I need to let that one go. Yeah. And the three characters in quick succession are so very different from each other that the only common denominator is me. And I try as much to lose my own mannerisms in my acting. Not everybody can do it, and I don't know that I do it successfully yeah. either. So if I'm trying to lose the mannerisms that make me me, then all of those characters should be different. Do you think you could ever try like, you know, one of those ones where you're doing like a complete, like an American accent mm -hmm. or like, have you ever experienced that? And do you think you'd be good at maybe doing a show, maybe having to do like a South African accent or an American accent? You know what? Ask me in, at the end of next year. Yeah. Because Elliot's English, this character I'm doing is Nigerian, the next one's maybe American, so... So we'll see. We'll see <laughs> we'll if see. we're hearing any Ijebu <laughs> the inside New York. <laughs> so those fight scenes and, you know, those like I said, those were some of the best and most realistic fight scenes I've, I've ever seen. So can you like talk us through like how, because how do you guys manage to pull that off that obviously it looks like someone is actually getting mm -hmm. like destroyed, mm -hmm. but like they're actually fine. 
So no like way. how how much coaching is involved? Is there like yeah. a so like how there's like an intimacy coordinator for like sex scenes? Mm -hmm. Is there like a fight, like a you know, fight? Yeah. So yes, how how does that work and how much how physically tasking is it as well? So I've only within the last sort of 18 months been let into the process of creating it. Okay. Because when I arrived at Gangs in London, they had created those fight sequences before I got there. Okay. So when I say sequences, like like they they've so every, if, if it wasn't you, someone else would be doing those exact things. Or like, yeah, 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 yeah. So th the way Gareth especially works is that he will shoot a film of the fight sequence before we shoot the fight sequence so that we can all see this is the story of the fight. This is exa exactly, it's not an approximation, it's yeah. exactly where the camera is going to be to see this hit, see. to see that hit, I and see. they're going to move through like this. Yeah. And so to the point where when we're shooting the scenes, he will then have an editor on field who will take the thing that we just shot and then put it into the jigsaw of that fight sequence. I see. Okay. So say we, we took four and a half days to shoot a fight one time. And as we were going through it, we could see, oh, this is what we have left to do because it turned into a green uh, screen. And then come back to that. And it's, it's lovely to see your own progress yeah. live. Yeah. You know? Um, do you enjoy them? Like, do you enjoy those scenes? Like, like the process of actually making it, do you enjoy it? And when you actually see like how it comes out on TV, like what's, you know, what's that feeling like? So do you enjoy it, first of all? Like those scenes? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Actually, it depends on who you're working with. Okay. Like working with Gareth and Jude and Chris and Men's, my stunt double, um, and Tim in the second season, and even this year working with Adam Horton, who's the guy who choreographed this year. Okay. Like those are good guys, mm. you know? Um, I've worked with other fight directors who are like really great guys. And then you work with some people who aren't. You know, and I think it's the same in any industry. Like some people, sometimes you just click with people. Yeah. You can spend time in each other's company, um, and then some people it's just like, yeah, let's work yeah. and then let's go home yeah. and not tr not chat anymore. Uh, so, but specifically working on Gangs of London, um, I've really enjoyed the stunt departments that I've worked with, which makes it feel like not so physically draining. Yeah, yeah I have to go through like the cardio <laughs> to get the stamina in order to perform those yeah. scenes over and over and over again. But like, if we're laughing whilst we're doing it, then it's stealth fitness, yeah. you know? So how, mu how much training, like personal training do you have to do in terms of like how to hold a gun or, you know, like how to punch? It's and interesting, like, like Every single year of Gangs of London, they said, oh, we're going to get you down to the range. We're going to get you, going to get you armory training. And not once did they do it until this year. <laughs> and even when we did it this year, it was like for two hours. And then, oh, here's this gun. Here's that gun. Okay, go home. Um, so, and then people are always very surprised when I'm able to handle a gun well. Okay. And I don't know why that is. I don't know <laughs> what films I've watched. Yeah. If, or if it just is sort of, um, what's the word? If it's... Uh, instinctive to me, how this thing will be maneuvered, etc. But yeah, I, I actually haven't done that much practice, practice that much that. Um, fight training. I did karate and judo at school when I was younger, but that's not, it doesn't that's translate the, yeah, directly. Yeah, of course, yeah. What does translate directly is one's willingness to put their body in positions of pain, yeah. one's willingness to learn. And I mean, when I was playing American football, we had a, a chat with a coach who was in America and he said, in order to play this game, you have to have a reckless abandon for your body. And I think maybe I should tattoo that on my body somewhere because like <laughs> I have injuries to show that I have reckless abandon for my body. But also like I really believe in that level of commitment. Yeah. If you're going to do something, do it well or don't do it at all. Yeah. And that's how I feel when I, I'm offered the challenge of these fight sequences yeah. or the challenges of accents or the challenges of generally portraying characters. If yeah. you're going to do it, do it well. Otherwise, people that's after me. you're dead will remember that you didn't do that thing well. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. So gangs, of, so you've shot the the last season. Yeah, yeah. So what? Obviously, you can't say anything about it. But like, are you excited? Are you like very excited for that for that one to come out? And you know, what can we expect? Every season of gangs has had a slightly different aesthetic because of we've had three different lead directors. There's been unfortunately no continuity throughout, yeah. but that happens. People get different jobs. Um, and this year we've worked with a Korean director called Kim Hong Sun. Okay. Um, and he's bringing a different aesthetic. Yeah. Yeah. The way he sees the world. Like, I, I know Korean cinema is very popular around the world at the moment. Uh, films like Parasite and Handmaiden. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Done very, very yeah. well. So it's now interesting to see what that Eastern aesthetic is going to bring to the world of Gangs of London. Like, yeah, it's going to yeah. go down. So for, like, us again, like, going behind the scenes, 
you we mentioned how you could shoot something and mm -hmm. it comes out in like two years. So now mm -hmm. you've shot this, like obviously we don't know when it's gonna come out. But what's that process like where you shoot something like and it's still not out two, three years after and you were like, you don't know how that happened, you don't yeah. know, you don't even know what's going on, you don't know when it's gonna come out. I'm in that process at the moment, actually. There's a film that I shot a couple of years ago, and it's been radio silence since I came off the plane back to shoot it. Like no one has said anything. <laughs> I don't know if they're just going to sneakily drop. Maybe the film's not good. So they're okay, just, like, so oh, just going to put it on Netflix <laughs> and no one will see it. Or, or maybe they're planning some big reveal at some point. I don't know. There's so much There's, there's so much that goes into the business side of show business. Like I've done the show. Yeah. We've created the film. I'm sure they've, they've edited it together very well yeah. somewhere. But now it's like, oh, we have to release it at a certain time of the year in order for it to be best received. Yeah. Don't do it in the summer because there's going to be the Euros and people are going to be watching yeah, that yeah, and yeah. not the series yeah. or the film. And then it's just like, ah. But we just want to share this thing, <laughs> yeah. share this thing that we made. Uh, with you people. worked hard on, yeah. Yeah, that's, but that's a crazy patience, concept. Man. That's a crazy concept. I think that's another thing that's different about film and television over theater. Yeah. When you act the theater, people are consuming yeah, the theater immediately. Yeah, yeah. You know, people can come and see you live. It's that instant, like, yeah. you know, gratification from it. And you are your own editor. Yeah. Whereas true, when true. you do film and television, they'll be like, okay, thank you for your yes, service. Yeah, yeah. Bye. Yeah. We're going to go away and um, make this thing where you come out to how be. they exactly. almost portray you. You watch the film and be like, that's what yeah. I did. That's not what I remember. I said, yeah, yeah, we just had to change a couple of lines and like change a couple of angles and we got someone to do your voice for this bit but because we didn't want to bother you. I'm like, wow. So, you do so, yeah. So you lose all control. In a way. Mm. Okay. So moving on briefly from Gangs of London to Gangs of Lagos. Mm -hmm. So I saw you were at the premiere yeah. um, when it dropped. Um, what are your thoughts? And like a crazy thought came to me like, a crossover potentially with yeah. <laughs> like Gangs of London and Gangs of Lagos someday like that would, that would be that would be insane when I saw that Gangs of Lagos was being made I was like what's happening man yeah. how can you just take Gangs of London and put, <laughs> Gangs of London and put Lagos in front of it and if you're going to do that you have to call me man I have to, yeah. I have to appear in it yeah. somehow but I didn't realise that like the story is very different. You yeah, know? Okay. It's not even like a universe thing. People are like, oh, hang on. There's gangs of New York, gangs of London, gangs of Lagos, gangs of Stockholm. Is there going to be like a cross? I was like, no, no, no. They're all very different entities. But it would have been cool for me to just like, you know, walk in the background of that yeah, thing. Yeah, I, I, I think that would be amazing. Yeah. If they had called me, I would have done it, man. Yeah. Um, but it was, it's amazing. It's, it's an amazing, amazing film. I'm very proud of everybody that's a part of it. And I was, I was delighted to be at the London premiere as well. So you mentioned like you're working on something at the moment mm -hmm. in, in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So is this your first, is this your first time working or shooting in Nigeria? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my first time. <laughs> what's that experience? What's that experience been like? It's different. It's very different. Like I think set culture and um, the way things happen is very different. But are you adapting? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Um, but you know, I'm 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 really delighted to be here. I'm really, really uh, excited to be able to contribute to the Nigerian like film history to be a part of that. Yeah. You know, um, and not just like a spectator from afar. Yeah. It's cool. So, what are your thoughts on like Nollywood and like because obviously now we're growing a lot. I remember growing up, I watching a lot of it. The storylines were always incredible, but like the obviously the props, the execution, the, the ex execution, the effects, all those mm -hmm. things were a bit substandard. But I think now that like, you see the quality coming out, like the visual quality, like mm -hmm. the excellence. Like, what are your thoughts on like how Nollywood is? I think growing it was in 2016 the when the Wedding Party came out. Yeah, and I think yeah. it was the first film yeah. that I saw in a Nigerian cinema, and I was gassed, yes. bro. Like. I was like, yo, this is where we are now. We are competing internationally yeah. with the way that we present our films and our stories. This is incredible. I can't wait to see more of it. And we've only really gotten better since then. Um, I think that was a key, that wedding, the, the wedding, yeah, that was a key one, I think, because I think everyone saw that and it opened eyes to something mm. completely different mm -hmm. from what we normally produce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's a great, that's a great point. I think, um, but also, in all things, it's not everything that you can compare from Nigeria to the rest of the world. Some things are just Nigerian. And that's not to say that uh, substandard is Nigerian or that Nigerian is not as good. But there are some things that are just like, no, like this is how we choose to tell our stories. Like sometimes I'm sat there watching Nollywood and be like, this scene could have been edited down. It's going on for too long. Yeah. But I'm coming with, a, coming with the aesthetic of like, this is how Hollywood does it or this is how they do it in England or Korea. So it's like, no, but this is how we do it in Nigeria. Yeah. So our stories are long-winded because we're long-winded people. Yeah, yeah, we like we to talk. Yeah, we talk. We shout in our films because we shout. Express. We're very expressive, yeah, yeah. you know? So I don't think it's right for us to just be like, oh, we have to be doing it like the white people are doing it. Yeah, no, know? that's good. Point, yeah. um, I think there's a lot that other film industries can learn yeah, from Nigeria as well. But yes, we want our quality 
we want to be able to choose that our quality is as good or not as we want to yeah. and let, let that be like an artistic choice yeah. as opposed to like uh, trying to just imitate yeah. I think it's a great point so quality doesn't necessarily mean like imitation it could be like the quality that we're producing but it could be in our, in our own way showing Absolutely. our values yeah, yeah, the yeah, way yeah, we yeah. are express ourselves mm-hmm. and everything I think that's a great point so normally before we leave I have like a, a redemption segment where we talk about things that maybe a place you struggled at um, a job you failed at and like how you were able to recover from that. So like in your whole career, mm. or it could even be personal life or whatever, was there a time like you failed, like you actually felt like you failed at something, you tried something and it didn't work out, or like maybe you struggled with something and it didn't work out, and then you were able to overcome that and the experience helped you, helped you going forward? Now this thinking is not that I've actually just succeeded in everything yeah. that I've done, that's not a real life story. Yeah. But it's just like, what's the most useful, what, what can I recall? Because I think it's, it's useful to learn from your mistakes yeah. and learn from your failures and then to leave them behind. I, I'm so that's why I'm struggling to like yeah. recall one that I'm just like it's actually. So that maybe like a right. so maybe like a maybe something maybe not necessarily failed at, but like maybe like a movie, like while mm-hmm. shooting it, maybe the line oh, that you struggled. In fact, I tell you what, I struggled with the first ever TV show that I did. Okay. It was a Channel 4 series called The Mill. Okay. Um, I shot it in 2000. It was my first day of set, which was the 10th of February, 2014. Okay. Um, and I shot it that spring, and I think it came out in the August of that year. And I struggled with it because it was my first time ever doing something like long form on, <laughs> on camera. I had done like some student short films, for example, and they, the ones that I had done were not worth anything. <laughs> um, and it meant a lot. I was going to be shown on national television. You know, I had a role that wasn't yeah. small. It wasn't the lead, but it wasn't small. Yeah. I had to have my own storyline, had my own sort of like romantic love interest. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, yo, like do this thing well, or it might be the last thing that you do. <laughs> the pressure was on. And on the that. reason I say that ugh, I didn't fail, but I didn't achieve the way I wanted to, okay. is because when I sat down to watch that thing, I couldn't see anything. All of the hard work, all of the sort of like, I created a, a Bible on my character. Yeah pictures and like cut-ins, clip-ins, preparations for all the scenes, how I learned my line, just like this. And then when I watch the show, you can see none of that work on the... Because I hadn't learned camera technique. I thought that I come from theater, so everything that I was doing had to be smaller. And like do it it for the camera, not for the, the auditorium. And I came too small. So like, yeah, I was thinking my thoughts, but Nobody else could tell yeah, what my thoughts yeah, were. And that's yeah, yeah. the point is to share the story. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I sat down and I, I failed. I, I will never... And you learn, no and you learn from that. From yeah, them. no one will employ me again. And I think one of the things I was worried about was vanity. I don't want to go and look at the take and be like, oh, my face isn't good or the clothes isn't well, my hair's not looking... Ah, that's not what I'm... Fo- I, mean, yeah. I have to focus on the performance and what's in the eyes and what am I transmitting, as Arteta likes to say. <laughs> Um, Another Arsenal reference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so from that, I had I watched it and was like, okay, cool. That's now my base layer. Yeah. How can I improve from here? And it was about practice. Every time I did an audition where I recorded myself, forced myself to watch it. Like, okay, I didn't convey what I wanted to. Let me try it again. Yeah. And that was so. Yeah, from that failure, I didn't know that that that, that could happen. Yeah. You know, there are things that will happen in your life that you don't expect. But it's then how do you use that opportunity to, how do you treat it as an opportunity and use it to grow? Yeah. And it was forcing myself to watch myself more. Yeah. That is how I grew from that. Yeah, bro. That this has been an amazing conversation, man. And uh, again, I'm so proud of you, man. What, Thank I've you. been watching you grow. Like I said, from seeing him uh, on Black Mirror and like pointing, like, oh, I know him, I know him, and to doing like really, really big things now. I'm so proud of you. I want more moments like that. For yeah. You uh, and uh, for everybody I can't else. wait. Yeah, I can't wait. So. Um, just on the final words, so I'm just saying like all Nigerians, all of us like young people in court still, um, he's one of us and he's doing amazing things. So just continue to support him. I will, I'll continue to plug all he's doing. But like he said, like he wants it to be organic and, you know, we're going to see him grow in the next decade, two decades, three amen. decades, amen, um, by amen. the grace of God. And um, bro, again, I'm so proud of you, man. Thanks, Thank for, you, man. thanks for coming on. Thank you for having thanks me. Thanks for coming on. It's great to be here. Um, so please like, share, and subscribe um, so I can continue bring amazing guests like this and to share the content to more people. Um, thanks for watching the show. Take care.